Welcome back to uh, part seven of a four-part series of Mezcal Monday. We are currently waiting for a couple panelists here, uh, Yvonne and Miguel here, but uh, we're here to talk about some kind of alternative Mexican spirits this week. Uh, there's a hint in Lou's background, and it's not, not just- You're not talking about my- For suburban he parents. Did, when yes, you he did about, not- he, when you talk about nope. my background, you're not talking about dropping out of college, right? Because that had nothing <laughs> to do with all. Okay, it had a little bit to do. Well, it was more mainstream Mexican spirits, if I'm being honest. So we were supposed to have Yvonne here to talk about Abasolo whiskey. Let's see if I can we're hoping, uh, I believe our friend Morgan uh, is out there. Morgan, if you can get a hold of Yvonne and, and see what is going on we'll start meantime we lou tell us about the corn eucopia of uh, uh on display behind you so behind many puns <laughs> corn eucopia it's very good yeah so okay so i've got these great friends um down in mexico city who have what they call a um hey. oh, thank god who have nice. what they call the lojia and it's just a bunch of agave geeks who collect um collect rare agave spirits from all over Mexico and they get together and they talk about them on a weekly basis. And one of the guys is also the chef who stopped working in restaurants so that he could start um, helping to preserve. And this will tie right into Yvonne. Hi, Yvonne. Right into what Yvonne's doing. Um, <laughs> who, started, who started this project to preserve, I think what he called the 38 different maize, different corn varietals uh, that uh, are endemic to Mexico State. So he's making all of these beautiful tortillas in his place. It's a uh, uh, Sal, and I'll, I'll put into the, the little chat thing uh, a link. Uh, so if you're ever in Mexico City, you can go visit his project so that you can, you can taste tortillas made by all of these beautiful varietals of corn behind me. They held a, a party in my honor that was a corn party. It was, uh, which is not incidentally, it sounds like porn party, but it's not, it's a corn party. You're, you're muted, Monique, but I know you, okay, but you probably what you're saying isn't any worse than what I'm saying. So um, they held this party and we ate delicious <laughs> tortillas made by all these, with all these different corns. By which, all these porn stars. It's by amazing. all these corn stars. They were corn stars. Corn it's, stars. Speaking of corn stars, we have Yvonne Saldana now. Yvonne, he can't welcome. unmute himself. He's not sure how to unmute. There, there we no, go. He's unmuted. Hi, hey, Yvonne. Doc. Oh, can you hear us, no. Yvonne? Hi. He didn't even hear that introduction, did he? Oh, I don't know. We heard you, Yvonne, when you were <laughs> unmuted. Here, oh. you were, yeah, you're muted, Yvonne. Yes, one second, sorry, I have some issues here with my... That's perfect. We can hear you. We can hear you, you're good. As well? We're... Now you're oh, unmuted. Wow. Look at, we're, we're doing really well. <laughs> good, thank you. Yeah. Very good. He smiles, so, he smiles. You look so thanks. serious. No, so, thank uh, you for the invitation. So Yvonne, were you able to hear uh, any of Lou's story about the different heirloom corns in the market in Mexico City? I heard there was a big party full of different varieties of heirloom corn uh, in his honor. Uh, but sounds very exciting. Beautiful corn of different types, as I can see, really beautiful. Uh, one of the things that are more diverse, because I can see some of them, is popcorn uh, corn that in Mexico comes in multiple colors. And uh, they, they are grouped in, in, a, in a type of corn that they call crystalline corn, because you can actually see through it. It's, uh, the starch is organized in such a way that becomes crystalline, transparent, uh, but there are some black ones I can see there. And uh, when they crack, they are also white. They are not black, but, uh, but they are cool, the, the popcorn of colors. Yeah. Yeah, they're beautiful. So, um, so I guess, you know, sort of tell us about, we're used to, We've been running, this is actually the seventh week of what originally started out as a four-week recap of Mezcal and Tequila. But as we went down the road talking about Mezcal and Tequila, then we decided we really needed to talk about things like, uh, we needed to talk about uh, uh, other like Sotol 
and other agave spirits. And then we started talking about rum and some tradition there. Aguardiente, and now yeah. because of aguardiente and, and now because of what you're doing, we decided, well, you know, corn is a very important crop in Mexico. And now we have somebody, my understanding is, is that it, there is a history of distilling with corn in Mexico, correct? This isn't necessarily I mean, something that's new. Yes, it's strongly influenced by the United States, but particularly during Prohibition, there was a uh, production happening in the north of Mexico. And uh, so, so producing spirits out of corn was already there. More to fulfill the expectation of the, of the American drinkers during Prohibition. And recently, I think there's a couple of people that are truly exploring things in a beautiful way different varieties of corn from different places in Mexico. Uh, so I really think uh, very exciting things may be coming. They are already there, but maybe coming uh, in a near future. I mean, we can never forget that, well, corn is one of the very incredibly diverse uh, group of plants we have here in Mexico, but we also inherited from Asia sugarcane. We also uh, have uh, other, other, seeds and plants like amaranth, for example, that now I'm looking into it as well, because I think it's quite mm. exciting. And, and, and well, we are a country, one of the mega diverse countries in the world, that we also were part of this globalization that happened 500 years ago. So we have grapes that were brought from Europe, we have sugar cane that came from Asia. We have sent things out but we also own or things like pineapple that is an American plant that many people don't know. So I really think we are in a moment where, where the craft of, of spirit that for sure is even the strongest will be uh, agave spirit, but suddenly this craft can suddenly be translated into exploring other raw materials, other products, and, and that's exciting. I think we always think of corn in its use when we think of corn in Mexico. You you think of tortillas, and that makes perfect sense and makes that. And I I put a, I changed my background just for a second. I kind of hate this, but Lou and I were talking about this earlier. But this is you can tell backwards that it says American whiskey at the top, but this is obviously in Spanish and was produced in Mexico because even this whiskey, which if you can kind of see the bottle, was called American bourbon but was produced in Mexico until the law changed in 1964. So is really, it, is during, it, is go it, ahead. Mexico is America. Well, as a continent, it is. Right, mm -hmm. right. For sure. But well, but, we, we don't want to deny that the identity of the United States was to claim that a group of states joined together in this, con in this, in this continent and decided to put a name like the group of states that joined in the continent of America. I mean, at least that's how I read the United States of America. But Lou, you are right. And look, don't, don't, don't try to uh, turn on that flame because I mean, it's, it's, it's common that Latin Americans, we like to fight with the idea that the word America should be entitled to the entire continent, but yes. Yeah, but it didn't, but legally until 1964, really from prohibition, a lot of bourbon, what was considered bourbon, and even if people go back and sort, you know, there's a massive market, secondary market for these early bourbons during prohibition, all these other things. And in some cases, they were made in Mexico till 1964, mm -hmm. till we changed the law here. So it's actually fairly recent that this is just an uh, United States of America products construct as far as bourbon goes. But there's very strong history of making Great, beautiful. I mean, this Abasolo is really gorgeous. Thank well, you. When Thank did you. you. So when did that project start for you, I guess? Because we also know that you were, you know, involved in Ancho Reyes and doing some other things. So when did the project to, to make corn whiskey start for you? So, so, I mean, it started conceptualizing it six years ago. And we did the first ex exercises five and a half years ago. And it took quite a long way. I mean, we discussed, I mean, there was big discussions if making something for corn should be whiskey or not. That was part of the discussion. Uh, it started as an exploration of the potential of corn, which, uh, I mean, we, we touched multiple different varieties, but at the end, we, we married with this specific variety called Cacao Simple. And But the idea of making corn whiskey uh, or the idea of, 
pursuing uh, the exploration of corn came after we, as a team, me, Danny, and Moy, realized that after making Montelobos and Ancho, we were not anymore uh, only brand-oriented, but that we had a purpose that was beyond brands, that was about exploring the potential different raw materials could have in Mexico. Both, both those are, are endemic, that are original, originally from Mexico, that had existed for their entire natural history here, as well as other ingredients that came into Mexico have become super huge, uh, like sugar cane, for instance. I mean, there's many things we haven't yet explored uh, enough yet. But, but then from making Montelobos and Ancho, we realized we had to rename ourselves we put the name Casa Lumbre, which means House of Fire. And we, we built this purpose that was exploring the, the, the biological, cultural, and sensorial uh, heritage of Mexico and how that can contribute to the world of spirit. So that got clear after launching Ancho Reyes. And then Corn, which so far has been the most challenging and long project before launching I have ever made in my life. Uh, and, and has been full of, of really wonderful things, I have to say. I mean, also a few things went wrong at the beginning, but I think we've just been blessed. And it's so incredible, and I have to say how lucky I am to, to develop and, and, and work with, with product spirits in Mexico because you explore something and, like, most of the chances is that things are going to go good for some reason. And... The same happened with rescuing the recipe of Ancho Reyes and now with the corn. It took a little bit long because there were so many possibilities with the corn. Again, from being whiskey or not being whiskey to decide to make a, 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 a spirit, a corn spirit or a whiskey or something else. And at the end, we decided to, to split really clearly the effort. One is Nixta, that right now is a corn liqueur. Uh, maybe there may be other exploration into the corn through that brand Nixta. We still don't know, but for the moment it's a corn liqueur. And on the other side is uh, Abasolo, that we properly wanted to create a space for developing whiskey from Mexico. And, and one part, of course, was the raw material. The other, the other part of the question was to ask ourselves, well, we don't really want to make bourbon in Mexico. And it's not because bourbon has anything wrong. Uh, well, except the type of corn is most of the time used, but I'm going to leave that for the latest. You don't, but, you don't uh, that's the good one. That's the good I was going to say, you don't think number two dent is sexy? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's overused. And, and, and look, it's, it's the biggest factory of chemicals in the world. You can make sugar. You, you can make a high fructose syrup. You can... You can put fat in, in, in cattle. You can make bioethanol or ethanol. I don't know how bio, not because it's organic, but because it comes from plants. You can do a lot of stuff, obtain fats and oils. But I don't think the history of the breeding of the, of the yellow corns in the United States, the industrialized corn, has really just been based on yield, on the capacity of enlarging economically uh, a, a, a lot of stuff with the lowest possible price. In Mexico still, the, the, the human selection, the process of keeping and deciding what to, what to plant the following season, uh, thanks God, and, and uh, there's a lot that has been lost, but thanks God, there's a steal of variety that within the multiple variables considered when you're going to plant a, a crop the following year, flavor this intangible but very real component that give us nutrition, at least I truly believe that the, 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 the experimentation of flavor connects with the calories and everything we, we, we introduce into our bodies, that element has been also considered by these farmers through generations. So we make flavorful corn that may not be as guilty as yellow to then whatever. You corn, got it. You got it. But but that but that is truly selected because flavor is is 
is fundamental because we eat the corn. We don't process it to transform it into something else. Corn is part of the Mexican culture. So in that sense, I, I understand why, unfortunately, this extraordinary whiskey industry that is in the US does not have so many options in terms of, of, of local heirloom corn that is attractive flavor-wise. While in Mexico, we do not have such a strong and developed uh, whiskey culture, but we do have a great potential of exploring the flavors of course. But you know, what's interesting, Ooh, Yvonne, is that the way that the American market is going is that the smaller producers, especially those linked with farms and farming and that live in an agricultural area, I'm from Nebraska, from a you know, like farm family, is that they're going back, the innovation is using those heritage corn strains. We would love to have you the next time you're in Chicago and things can travel. We actually have a local producer that we do a lot of work with at Benny's called Whiskey Acres. And they are first and foremost corn producers, but they have set aside, they, they, they grow all their own corn and they're growing that too. Um, but they are also growing acres of Oaxacan blue. They've experimented with a number wow. of heirlooms mm -hmm that they're using not only to make whiskey, but they're also, they started growing these corns because there was a market for the corn, for the flavor in food. And they decided, well, if we can grow it for food, we can produce whiskey. There's a producer in, um, I'm space named Monique, in upstate New York that's also doing heirloom corn strains. Oh, I, uh, I, I know, and I mean, Jay Henry, our partner's up in Madison. Yeah, Jay Henry Madison, is doing Wisconsin. Your corn, right? They're, they're generational, you know, eighth generation corn growers. And so this is what they have gone back to now is they're actually seed corn farmers. So they're actually then going back and seeding all of these things that were not being grown currently, but they existed in a seed bank. So they pulled all of those things back out of the bank. And the flavor of these whiskeys is phenomenal and very young, especially because they're not taking on so much of the wood you know, it's, it's the actual yep. latent flavor of the corn varietal. So how old, I mean, are, are some of the whiskeys in this that's bottle? Only, I mean, that, that's, that's a um, ex bourbon barrel with new toasted uh, American oak. Toasted, <laughs> not, not uh, charred. So toasted so it's ends. A, yeah, it's toasted. That's one fraction of what, what the barrels are for AG. And the other one at ex bourbons. Uh, we didn't want to use chard because we wanted it's two years, two years aging in an environment that brings even more maturity. And I will tell you a little bit about where the, the distillery is, but we are, I mean, the, 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 the distillery is 2,600 meters above sea level. So multiply that wow. by three and you will have that. If it is one of the 10 uh, highest um, uh, whiskey distilleries in the world, so, so it's, so we have a lot of changes in temperature from morning to, to night. Never as hot as Kentucky, never as cold as Kentucky. It's milder. I, I, what I'm saying is the minimum will be to be minus three degrees for three hours during the winter, just in the middle of the night. And the, the highest temperature will be in a super hot day, 25 degrees. And oh, wow. because it's so high, it's so high and it's in the, in the, oh. in the central part of Mexico, where we have the plateau that is really formed by the Sierra Madre Occidental and Oriental. And we have a really high areas like Mexico City is also really high. And this is a slightly like 300 higher in, in altitude than Mexico City. The so also, Yvonne, that's going to lower the distillation temperature as that well. That also becomes, look, it, you have a trade-off because yes, you, you can distill in lower because the, the atmospheric pressure is, is lower, which allows you to reduce the, the, uh, the boiling point of alcohol is lower. But the truth also is that the efficiency of burning a, 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 a fuel that we use gas and we uh, warm up water becomes less efficient as well because oxygen is less abundant oh. in, in, in high altitude. So you kind of finish in something that is kind of a uh, the, 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 let's say the improvement you make energetically by being in a higher altitude gets eaten by the efficiency of, of burning uh, a fuel because of the lack of oxygen. Um, but but it's, we have other things that are cool. We are using a yeast that takes around five days to ferment uh, in high gravity, which means 
super high concentrations of sugar. So it's a special yeast and that gives us a real energetic benefit because you have a mash with lots of sugars that produce lots of alcohol and the amount of heat you need to increase temperature of one liter of mash is going to be the same kind of any other, but you will get much more alcohol from that than from a normal mash that have less sugar in it. So what so, kind of alcoholic strength will you get from the beer at that point? Uh, my, my low wine is 40% alcohol and I'm 40? doing a 40% and it's a, wow. it's a very simple uh, uh, steel. I mean, there's no plate or anything and it's delicious too. Uh, I, I eventually I can send you just the white spirit. Forty really percent right. low wines. That's oh, I mean for for people listening, that's like twice as high yeah. as anybody else's. I mean that's that's yeah. If you're so double high. distilling in Scotland, you're usually twenty percent. Twenty. Yeah. Yeah. So so is any of that at all whatsoever uh, due to the fact that the corn is also being grown in uh, the higher altitude and therefore tougher conditions than most corn in the U.S. and therefore maybe it becomes sweeter as a result. No, no, the, at the end, I mean, the concentration of, of carbohydrates that the, the, the cacao was simply. So let, let me go by step, but for the moment, I, I, you're going to get perfectly, but for the moment, I'm going to answer your question. It's more about the formulation in the mash than it's about the specific characteristic of the corn. So, but coming back to the question, well, we got this interest in corn. We explore multiple varieties of it. And and then we start to discard some. For example, popcorn corn. The, one of the centers of diversity of popcorn corn that I was super excited at the beginning is also Estado de Mexico, the central part of Mexico where our corn comes. But we had to discard it because the amount of fat was huge and, and too much fat wasn't that good in terms of flavor. Cacahuacintle is in a totally different group of corns that are called conic. They are rel relatively... Uh, not very long, it's more fatty and short, with big grains. It's, it's a corn of altitude, like choclo in Peru, the Peruvian corn, the choclo and the cacahuacintle, they are connected. They have physiological similarities from the size of each one of the grains, they, they are similar. The concentration of fat is low. They are in the group of the, also they call the flowery uh, corn, because they are really white, so the, the way the starch uh, accumulate, instead of being clear, clear, they are actually like a, really like a powder, like a white powder. And they are not so, let's say, densely packed, the, the molecules of starch. They are more fluffy, let's say. So this corn, the cacao simply we use, only grows above 2,000 meters above sea level. You cannot find it below that altitude. Uh, and the distillery is like 50 kilometers away from where our farmers work. I really, coming to you, the point we were discussing about the variety of corn, I really think that right now as distillers, we have to think that, that alcohol is really an agronomical product. And that, and that we have to come back to think that, that the agriculture and what happened in, the, in obtaining your raw material is fundamental for your spirits. Uh, I mean, in the case of other projects, I, I have a uh, lead like Montelobos or Ancho Reyes. We realized that the product will, were as good as the raw material we were able to, to, to obtain. So, so in this case, we also started by identifying the variety of corn, but most importantly than anything, the family that has been working with this corn for, from gen generation. From the multiple heirloom corns that Mexico has, cacahuacintle is one of the few that are still known by most of people because it's linked to a very particular dish that is famous in Mexico called pozole. Mm -hmm. So if you know pozole, cacahuacintle is the type of corn is used. So this corn that again grows only in the highlands, it also has, it's, it's a cycle that, that is a corn that lives with the rain, the rain season. You only have one harvest a year. And it's very traditional in September, October, because it's when this, this corn uh, matures. So we use it also a lot in, in the celebrations of independence in September for esquites. That is another, it, you don't need to use uh, cacao simple, but it's a traditional thing. Yeah, also roasted corn, like Lou is showing in the photograph. You had me, you had me a pozole. Yeah, so, so we took this. 
but it wasn't enough for us when when we started to say well we want to make a whiskey from mexico would it be enough just to get a heirloom corn from here or what is going to be the proposition what is truly the sensorial and cultural heritage we want to imprint in the whiskey we are making because yes making whiskey is not mexican this came from the scotch and the Irish that moved to the U.S. first, and, and they found the Appalaches, and, and they started to use those corns long time ago. That, uh, and, and, and well, that's the story of the, um, of the American whiskey. But what is the story of the Mexican whiskey, or the story of the Mexican corn? And that, then is when it becomes quite evident that nixtamalization was a technique that would have to explore, that, that we had to go to understand how the structure of flavor of what the way we eat corn is, is embedded into this 4,000 years old technique that implies cooking corn in an alkali solution, uh, typically using chalk, but you can also use ashes to change the pH and make it really high, very alkali, and then cook it there and leave it for 12 hours until the external uh, layer of the corn gets uh, dissolved, and then the, the, the molecules of starches absorb this and, 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 and experience chemical transformation. So the first thing is they will react with proteins and will create uh, a lot of flavorful uh, molecules. Um, uh, certain phenols that tends to be bitter, for example, they will be washed away out of the grain. Some of the fat will be washed away out of the grain. And you will do like a pre-gelatinization process in now talking like more in the, in the, in the argot of the, of the whiskey makers where water will enter and will make more um, easier to dissolve the starches later on. So when we discovered what was the effect of nixamalization, we were blown away. And that was really cool. Did so you, so, it's, so yeah. it's, it's pH control as much. Are there also enzymes involved in that? Is there anything, anything enzymatic that develops or is it all? During uh, nixtamalization? It, yeah, so or is it all to, the? No, there's no enzymes. This is just a chemical, a chemical process that implies heat, water at a particular pH, and the reactions that occurs by this corn being soaked in this water. Uh, you have to add lime. It's different too, from right? mashing. It's different from mashing. So I will try to explain the steps. First, the corn is produced in the fields. They are harvested. They are stored and let it to hard, to become hard, uh, really hard. Mm -hmm. Then we have a special technique to separate the grains out of the cup. The cacahuacintle has a very artisanal technique that instead of taking away the grain out, they shave the, the cobs. So the, 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 the embryo is most of the time not present because a saw uh. will cut the grain out of it. And that is what we receive in the, the distillery. There will be some corn with the embryo that we will use for malting, but I will explain later. So that corn arrives and we do the nixamalization, this cooking in an alkali solution. Then we wash it, we clean it. We still have the entire grain. They are full. You can... <laughs> Look at the web page if you want to see some photographs of what I'm explaining. Yes, Lou. I, I sorry. I just, like th I think this is really interesting, and I'm assuming that corn whiskey made in other places. They're not doing the nixtamalization process, or do they have? Nobody to do has that? ever. God nobody no. has ever done any nixtamalization for. No, and, and honestly, Lou, now they I'm don't, playing. They don't... Now I'm playing with 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 um, um, with malt. Well, not malt with um, I cevada. Cow? The, the, the plant from where well, the malt comes, the barley, barley and mm -hmm. wheat. And you can nixamalize these things and the flavor change radically. You can so nixamalize so barley. You so, can yeah, nixamalize. Yeah, if you raise the alkaline levels high enough, if you change the pH enough, you could probably nixamalize anything. But no other how, culture. How are you does. raising the alkaline levels? I know for like a lot of the cooking hominy you would be, with add. add lime to it, right? Yeah, so you, we use lime in this pre-cooking. But after we pre-cook, we clean, and we still have the, the entire grains. Now they are fatter because they yeah, got it it. And then we do a second technique that is traditional in Mexican, in, in Mexican tradition, but more in the north. So 
Mesoamerica was mainly nixamalizing, but just after Nayarit and at that border, if you go to the north, cultures were not so developed, but we have more different type of tribes, like the, for example, the Raramuris that are the um, Tarahumara. And instead of doing nixamalization, they were doing something called pinole, which is to roast the grain and roasted grain transform into flour, they were using this flour for different techniques. The way they used to do it is they had a clay vessel with, with a typically um, sand, like a silica sand. They put inside the grains and they put it in the fire. So the silica sand will transfer the heat and will roast the grains. And, and then they will sieve that sand and get the, again back the, the grain toasted they mill it and they were eating this pinole. And uh, the Tarahumaras are famous for running marathons and eat this as a source of energy. Well, that concept is also introduced in our mezcal making. Once the corn is nixtamalized, then we put it in an adapted uh, coffee roaster. So we dry the grain again. So we first nixtamalize and we dry the grain and then we roast the grain. <laughs> so we have a nixtamalized roasted corn talking about nixtamalization and pinole uh, heritage, and we get a flower. That flower will be most, almost all of the base of our mash with the exception of a fraction that is the same corn, the cacao simple, but we will soak in water in dark and we will let them to sprout until a leaf and a, and a root is produced and we will malt that. And we would pull malted corn mix malted with our nixtamalized and roasted corn together in order to do the sweet mash. And that's that is your so enzyme. cool. And, that and is that's smart. your enzyme, right? That's right. And it's and that, yeah, that little bit of malted that's... corn gives the enzyme you need. It's and, also and, that, just... and that just helps you start fermentation. Well, right? and imagine the efficiency that you have from taking something that's been nixtamalized and then re-roasted, re re-dried. You have almost 100% conversion, unlike yeah. with yeah, other one of the you have plus and, and minus because the the cooking will also they will take like the flavonoids they, they will mild your corn let's say in the nixtamalization will bring a lot of flavor but you will also lose some of the starches inevitably because they will get even though you put the grain the full grain inside you will lose some of that starches in the in the we recover some because we also have I mean we we are zero waste uh, distillery. The, the nejayo, that is the leftovers of nixtamalization, are uh, fermented as well. So we transform that into a second class alcohol. It's not as good as the other, but everything at the end ends like a, a cattle food. And we have uh, relationships with the local farmers to take the wash, the wash and, and feed that to the animals around. Could that be? Could that be like a, a Mexican version of Wagyu? Can we get like some Mexican Kobe beef out of those cows? Are you gonna go massage steak? those cows? Well, maybe sounds cool. I mean, I haven't organized that. I know that uh, one guy <laughs> who is feeding is feeding uh, goats, and another guy that is feeding feeding beef. We, I said, I'm not gonna charge you because we give for free. It's super high protein. It's great thing what comes out, but in exchange. Once COVID is gone and we can have uh, guests like you guys and invite people to the distillery, we want to eat a goat and, and a, a, a area of cattle feeded with it. Yeah. Oh my uh, God, Mexican barbacoa wagyu. I'm on it. Yeah, it, it, it just, very quick, good. Quick, so, all right, guys, that's, hang on, hang on. Brett's I, favorite pastime is, is eating whole roasted animals. So <laughs> I think you'll get along very nicely. And, and when you're yes, talking about- I'm a big fan of whole roasted animals. <laughs> when you're talking about using lime for the nixtamalization, do you have a bunch of barbacks that are just squeezing the lime into the corn? Is that how that works, Ivan? No, I, I will have to explain what lime is in a specific. Okay. Okay. When I'm saying lime, I'm not referring to the fruit that is actually acidic. Yeah. I'm referring to the chow that you use in construction. This white powder, yep. mm -hmm. yeah, that is what I refer with lime. So, so no barbacks needed. I understand needed. the confusion because lime, spirit, may, well, then you imagine the lime, you know, but mm -hmm. it's not the fruit. I'm talking about this uh, uh, very basic uh, uh, oxide, uh, calcium oxide that is used in construction. And, and also a similar thing you can get from ashes that are really alkali as well. 
you can so meet Ivan, that folk. Can, can that we take, of a, take a step back because you're kind of a crazy person for thinking this up mm -hmm. and, and you're trying to find all the ways that you can to make it very endemic to Mexico and utilize these processes, which is amazing. Like this is incredible. Mm -hmm. How do you then find the distiller? How do you, is that person along for the ride? You're like, right, we're going to both do these things and you know how to distill things. And then how do you dis, how do you decide, how do you build the still? What do you model that after? So how were the origins of this distillery and this distiller? How did that come about? So the, the distiller, you refer to the people who operate the distillery, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, and, and based, I mean, it's based on the recipe I developed, but it's for sure that I'm not there every day. So... I have to give credit to the plant manager that is Ivan Sustaita and the team we got to, to run the processes I had the opportunity to develop. So and do the these profile. people think you're crazy? Like when you find them and you're explaining what you want to do, do they think you're crazy? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I think that I don't expose myself until I have something to give them to taste <laughs> and a process that seems to work. So, so far, no, they haven't told me I'm crazy. But what I, what I would like to think is that none of the ideas have come to our minds are, are coming from the vacuum. So, so innovate means much more about listening and observing than, than really being a genius, creating something out of the blue. I mean, I don't think I have done anything in my career out of the blue, but it's more giving context understanding the interaction of certain elements and, and um, giving the chance to the really important things to speak that in this case is what all these farmers have been doing for centuries. I mean, I have to say we are appropriating, taking into this whiskey uh, something that is not my, it's not my hand, it's not Casa Lumbre's idea, it's just a fact of extraordinary corn that has been for generations being grown in Mexico. That's one part. And the second are clever techniques that has been with us also for centuries. And that, and that if they are so extraordinary in the gastronomic world, well, let's make it work in the spirit world because at the end, we are just another expression of food. I mean, at the end, we are agronomical, an agronomical product. And, and, and consumers and people need to start to understand that their spirits start in the field, not when, not when the master of the stealer is deciding how to cut something that started much more earlier. Sorry, Lou, you wanted to ask something. I did, but I was laughing at Ed's comment. So, uh, you know, I, I have a theory, uh, Yvonne, and, um, I, I, and I've been saying this as though it's fact to a number of people. So um, if I'm wrong, I want to know that. My theory is because you're using this corn that absolutely is endemic to the state of Mexico um, and is ancestral and is not seen outside of Mexico. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I know I've been following Francisco. I was following Francisco Toledo enough to know about the whole GMO corn uh, versus heirloom maize uh, fight that was going on in Mexico. Um, my theory is that by making this spirit from this ancestral maize, that in fact, you are helping to preserve this species in perpetuity. Assuming enough people drink enough of this whiskey, which I intend to do. Yeah. Well, I think that any effort like the one we are doing will, first of all, I mean, in our case, one of the rules when we do any product is we, we want to take away any interaction. I mean, we want to deal directly with farmers. That happened in Ancho Reyes with the chilies we harvest. That happens in Montelobos with the agave we work with. And it's, it's exactly the same for Nixtan and Abasolo. Uh, so the first thing I would say is first, we recognize without intermediaries, with a better price, those that have been, the, they are the true heroes of all of these who are the farmers taking care of this uh, incredible varieties of corn. So that's, that's one thing. So I would like to think that Instead, and that's already happening, of moving into a um, into an hybridized uh, Monsanto style of corn, they can keep growing the corn they have. It's perfectly adapted for the land they own. Number one, and second, it, it really represents an extraordinary flavor profile. Is is this project allows that to keep happening? 
uh, the, the project we are having. Sure. And, and, and I feel, I mean, there's other wonderful exercises of other companies uh, from exporting heirloom corn from Mexico to the U.S. Or I know in Oaxaca in particular, there are some escaleros who have also got inspired with the local varieties of corn and they are doing also their, 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 their expressions. And I think that's, that's, that's incredibly cool. I mean, I think that's, that's the place from where Mexican whiskey should, should be going um, to, to look at these ancestral varieties of corn and, and, and try to make the most of them. For sure. But it's also, in my opinion, accompanied with the techniques, the, the culinary techniques that really make corn to taste like Mexican corn, like the nixamalization. Uh, so as I think we already covered, well, we receive the corn, we, we nixamalize it, we roast it, we make a flour, then we mash it with a portion of malted corn. That idea of malted corn, I took it from Peru. So in Peru, if you go to to the high areas, the Inca areas, they have a beer called Jora. So a very similar corn to cacao simple, called choclo, they call it choclo. They let it sprout, they let it to germinate, and then they mash it with water and they make beer out of it. And they drink it as a, it's the only, in Mexico, nobody knew about malting, nobody. I mean, the only ones who discovered that were actually uh, the Incas in Peru, who discovered the process of, of malting and then producing alcohol, taking benefit of the enzymes. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, the, as we already know, Northern Europe uh, also developed this with the beer and with all of these, they developed those techniques for the whiskey and for the beer, well, even from Iraq. And I mean, even previously, they, they learned how to do these things with, with, uh, with malted grain. But uh, with that idea came more from there, but it opened up the opportunity to offer a 100% corn whiskey that I thought was super exciting using the enzymes of the corn itself. So I think that, that's also quite cool. We, we do the mashing takes around 12 hours. And after mashing, we do this high gravity fermentation. Basically it's a 10,000 liters, 14,000 liters stainless steel tank uh, where we put the, the mash and then we use a champagne yeast. Again, my idea was I wanted super something very concentrated for two reasons that I'm gonna explain. Uh, one, because fermentation takes longer because it's more sugar to transform. You put yeast in a, in a very edgy, like a critical, difficult condition because the more sugar you have, the most stress the yeast perceives for an osmotic reason too much solutes in the liquid. But also when the sugar gets disappearing, they then produce alcohol, which is also quite stressful for the, for the yeast. But at the same time, the longer a fermentation is, the more alcohol is in contact with your entire mash. And alcohol is a solvent that can, is able to grab flavors and smells from your mash and dissolve it into their own self. So when you distill it, you get richer and nicer uh, alcohol. So most whiskey will ferment in 36 hours. So Ivan, Maximum. are you also, are you fermenting on any solids that are left? We put everything. Everything I mean, pumps over. Okay. Everything from the mashing, we don't, we don't separate. Everything is in our mash and we distill with everything. Wow. Uh, so you're so distilling all on the top. solids are there, but very importantly is five day fermentation in order to control things. So 120 the hours. grains doesn't have enough protein. So we have to add extra nitrogen, but we put very little every day, a tiny amount. So we ensure that the yeast is never going too fast and it takes the entire five weeks to ferment. So and you do that. So, so you use nitrogen rather than temperature. Do you do have any temperature control or are you yes, controlling also, the fermentation we, we, strictly with we nitrogen? We also do that. We also do that. We, we re, because it's a small, you have to remember that the smaller a vessel for fermentation is, the better the transfer heat occurs because the surface per liter is, sure. is bigger. The bigger your container, you have more surface for the liters that are inside. So heat can actually be naturally released. We have coils to cool down, but normally it's quite fresh and we don't really have to, we don't really have, in part because we don't like nitrogen, too much nitrogen to make the, the yeast crazy. That's one. And second, because naturally the transfer 
to the air is quite, is, is quite uh, easy. If you have a 50,000 liters or like in these huge tequileras, 1, 000, there's no way, I mean, they're gonna burn itself. The, 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 the G's will not tolerate the heat they will create. So they have to inject a lot of uh, cold water. Yes, sorry, there's, there's um, more questions. No, that's right. Ivan, so, um, you know, the very long ferment and you said you're not often using any kind of cools in there. What, what strength is the wash when that ferment is done? What, what, sorry, what, did what, you what alcoholic strength is the wash after the fermentation? Around nine to 12. A little high, but not that A high. little bit higher, but not, yeah. but not that, not that much higher. That's really cool. And the nitrogen uh, also keeps, and you're talking about the long ferment. One of the things that happens sometimes, I, I, I'm assuming the nitrogen keeps the fermentation sort of even on a steady, right? Because spike. if you spike, it starts to eat itself eventually the yeast will start to eat alcohol rather than eating the sugar, which you don't want. That's also true. Yeah, but there's still a lot of sugar available, which they would prefer. So the idea is just okay. to control. It's like a horse that you are not letting go, but you are keeping it uh, just full to, to you. So it will go in a steady speed instead of yeah. getting crazy. Yvonne, and I think you said earlier, these are all sweet mash. So this is a brand new ferment every time. No, every time. Sound. I never take, okay. I so never yes. take back the, 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 the wash and mix it. I, we, we don't do that. It's, okay. uh, well, it's all the stillage mash. goes to the cows and goats. Excuse me? All the stillage goes to the cows and goats. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and then after the long fermentation, then we the steel twice in uh, copper steel, in a very simple onion style uh, uh, steel. They are 2,500 liters, so relatively small. And, yeah. and we do a, a, a slow distillation process. We take in the low wine like, like six hours, more or less. And then on the rectification, we take around eight to nine hours. Uh, but the surprising thing is we, we are able to obtain Almost the entire amount of alcohol comes out, the mix of all the cuts, around 37 to 41% alcohol. That's the range in which our low wines come. And it's already delicious. The only reason I'm not using that alcohol directly is because I need more proof to really extract interesting stuff out of the barrel. Mm -hmm. But if you ask me, I would be just drinking that all day long in the sense of how beautifully the corn flavor can come through. And from that idea, I'm going to explain Nixta at the end, because it's made from soup products of the distillery. But OK, we do this 40% alcohol low wine, and then we redistill, and we finish with a 62.5% okay. alcohol. And that 62.5% alcohol then gets into the barrels, most of them ex bourbon barrels, and a fraction new American toasted barrels. And, uh, and they enter for two years. And, and after two years, we, sorry, tell me. I just say, wondering on the cuts, where are you cutting the second distillation? And then the where is that? The heads and tails, I'm assuming you're taking heads or tails. And then are That's they redistilling? Too. That's surprising because as I mentioned, the low wines come so clean. And that really what the only thing we do in the second distillation is we take care of the head. That is a couple of liters only at the very beginning that tends to have more this more um, uh, methanol problem. Yeah, nail polishy, and it's yeah. more the sensorial than the, than the really the, the, the risk of it, because yeah, integrated doesn't make a difference. So we take that and the rest is just simply not cut. I mean, there's, there's really not anything left cut. I mean, when the, but there's no efficiency anymore in continue trying to bring alcohol with stop let's say, but that would be around when the alcohol is reaching, when, when the, the drops coming out is reaching 10%, 15%. So Ooh. we don't really cut anything. But, it's but, but, really weird. But yeah. do you, like, like if I wanted, you know, I, I, I hear what you're saying about, about methanol, but if I wanted like a, like a 200 uh, liter flask of the Puntas, would that kill me? Yeah. Would it make me blind? No. Or could I actually have that? I, I mean, I haven't done the analysis, but I don't think so. Still, in, in corn, methanol is, 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 uh, is really low. I mean, if mezcal doesn't kill you, 
also not. Well, sl uh, slowly. <laughs> it's, it's slowly. As long as it kills me slowly, I'm on. Definitely yeah. directed yeah. right at Lou. So when you <laughs> look in, like, still, still design, Yvonne, like what was your previous experience with whiskey? Like, did you look to another type very of- Very good whiskey? question. So I have to say the other day I was invited to a very fancy uh, group of people with incredible experience in whiskey. My background is to produce good quality white spirits. So I know tequila, I know mezcal. Uh, I did at some point a little bit of rum, distilling grapes as well in my old past. Um, but but uh, and I know a little bit of aging in the tequila world. I mean, I, I was in contact with that. But I still have so much to learn in the world of aging. Which which on the other hand. I am proud to say that that the kind of whiskey is coming out of this extraordinary corn is already delicious. So the complement of the wood, of course, is fundamental to be a whiskey. We're going to launch other expressions in a couple of years. I think one or two years, there's going to be another Abasolo out there. But, uh, but this first Abasolo was really about complementing the extraordinary expression of the corn with the wood. But it's not about the wood. The story of Abasolo is not about really so much the wood. Uh, it's also not, it, it's, it's truly about um, presenting, showcasing the complexity of corn flavor. Uh, and, and that was the purpose of this weird differentiated flavor. Because when you think on the whiskeys of the world, you think on Japanese, Indian, Australian. I mean, Scotch. now there's so many countries making whiskey. Generally, they will have probably something local because they have a particular type of cask because they maybe have wine or, but, but they typically are more similar to either a Scotch whiskey or an American style whiskey. Uh, we didn't want to replicate any flavor that existed before. We truly went to, wanted to to, to bring an, a, a flavor that is unique and differentiated. So Abasolo doesn't taste as any other whiskey you have tasted before. And, and I think that's exciting. I think that I in this that case, that and I don't want to say ignorance like you're an ignorant person, but I think in this yeah. case, obviously with your breadth of experience, ignorance is kind of bliss. Like you're not tied to anything else. You're not trying to take this raw material from a place, but say, oh, I like Japanese whiskey more than Scotch whiskey, I want to go this direction. You're trying to complement the raw organic material as best you can. It's, it's possible beautiful. that I was more obsessed to ensure that the raw material would tell a story and speak a beautiful, uh, a beautiful harmonic uh, tasting experience uh, than probably the wood. But, but no, look, I am ambitious enough to, I hope my ignorance will get diminished through time. And maybe I will surprise those that really knows about aging in a couple of years. But for the moment, this Abasolo, the one we wanted to embody the essence of the distilleria uh, Abasolo, this, this exploratory approach we are having to corn, uh, the one that will embody the effort is this one. And I think it's fine. I mean, I know particularly in Mexico that we are big whiskey drinkers, but also the idea of drinking whiskey is also this feeling of drinking what is not Mexican that is so uncool right now. I mean, everybody is jumping into Mexico is cool, but still there's a market for those that feel that it's much more cooler to drink a Scottish thing or an American thing that our own. Um, they we'll take everything they don't We'll take everything they don't want, Yvonne. Just send it right, send it to Chicago. I'll take care of it. But well, that's but what I was going to ask you is, do you see yeah. a market for this? What, you know, very No, of course we do. Oh. Of course we do. I actually, I would say the rule was people were, if you said whiskey or you say spirit, what was considered fancy, good quality, elegant, was non-Mexican 20 years ago. And in the last 20 years, well, tequila has become is the biggest, category in Mexico. Uh, mezcal is, 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 is going incredibly, growing a lot in Mexico. And I think the entire country is changing and is recognizing. And, and in multiple professions, I, I mean, you see, you see designers that now they go and learn about the traditional the textiles that you can find in the south of Mexico. And, and they are bringing that now to 
beautiful night dresses for for you know luxurious dresses or you see chefs like for example one example is enrique olvera he's not the only one who was educated in the culinary institute outside of mexico uh, he wanted first to make actually a spanish restaurant Puyol was a Spanish restaurant when it started. And then he realized that instead of trying to replicate Spanish food, what if he started to learn about the, the cooks that were in little towns and taking these recipes and, and recreating them in a different way to make fine dining. Uh, so chefs, designers, and I believe the stealers, why not? I mean, you see this. There's few people I admire. I mean, Eric, Eric Rodriguez, for example, the, uh, the, 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 that sells mezcal, he sells mezcal that he selects, but he also makes his own expressions that are the steel. And, and, and I think he does a beautiful job. And I think that the, the new Mexican distiller uh, has, to be, has to not only be about tradition, but also be about investigating the potential of things we have. Um, I mean, I, I am a big promoter of the traditional artisanal mezcals and, 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 and the products we exist, but I also believe that Mexico and Mexicans have the opportunity of exploration and that within the tradition and within the artisanal techniques is a great space for projecting all the potential or raw material has into beautiful products. All and of quite which frankly, I think no, I was just saying, quite frankly, Yvonne, you just, in, in that few sentences, you just encapsulated the whole purpose of why we started this series of Zoom tastings and, and, and podcasts. That's exactly why we did this. And, and, and it took getting to a whiskey producer to encapsulate what we were talking about when we started with agave, because that's what we wanted to do. It is not just what's this pop culture thing that's happening but what is actually at the core, what is at the core of Mexico? I mean, it was really an exploration of the culture of Mexico. All of which it, makes me think that we've, because we've got two minutes left, we need to talk about Nixta, because Nixta to me is so okay. Bad. And it I reminds me a, of my a, a, beloved a entrepreneurs. Minute. Quick, go. And by well, the we way, can, we're thinking of it. It's like we can, go, we can go over, by the way. We can. Okay, because we got to talk about the fact that you've got on sale both, I believe. I mean, you know, I don't work at uh, Benice, but I believe Pat, I believe Brett, I believe you have both expressions of Nixta and Abasolo on sale this week for people who want a special Halloween whiskey <laughs> or liqueur that, that involves corn, which you're going to eat during Halloween. Wait, you can get it right now. Out about it, oh, yeah. Okay, I'll shut up then. Uh, thank you. Thank you for for inviting others to discover what we do with our passion. But Nixta was an idea that came from the distillery itself. It's basically blending together soup ingredients. So we get the sweet mash. Once this thing is sweet and it's just ready to get into the fermentation vat, we steal some of that. We clarify it. We make a sweet uh, tole, this sweet uh, corn liquid. And then we mix it with the ordinario I mentioned. This first distillation, we bl blended together. And then um, we, we have the, the secret ingredients that we call base madre that is made only once per year. The first cobs to be collected when the, the corn is tender that we call elote. Elote is a fleshy, mm -hmm. fresh corn that you can press the, the grain and we'll take a, like a milk out. We take those cups into the distillery, we cut them, and then we macerate it in alcohol, we boil them, and then we concentrate them. And from there, we make this thing called base madre from the, the, uh, the, the, the fresh corn. And we mix that fresh corn with the sugar that comes from the, from the, from the mash, with the alcohol, and that's how we make nixta. Uh, we need a little bit extra sugar, so around... 25, 30% of the sugar that it needed extra, we use a piloncillo, which is a, a really raw sugar cane to give this extra sugar. We couldn't do it with a mash. I tried and I couldn't, I was trying to concentrate it, but got really complicated. So it's sweet mash, alcohol from the same corn and the base madre, mother base that is coming from tender corn. 
And these three things with a little bit of piloncillo is nixta. And when you taste it, it really is like a, a sweet corn liquid. Basically. I love atole. I haven't tried this yet, but I love fresh atole. So oh, I am so awesome. excited. I want to throw it in hot chocolate. That's like immediately that. Oh, yeah, that with sweet. coffee and chocolate goes well. And, 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 and so, okay, so that process you described, that's also how you make, I, 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 am, I like, I love. It's like entre- a variant of a Pinot de Chiron. Like there's a great tradition of doing something like this in, yes. in the, especially in the brandy producing regions in France. All of them do a similar thing where they take fresh pressed grape juice before they distill and mix that with an ordinary brandy that's young yeah. and have it as an aperitif as a sweet, is, as a sweet is, liqueur. And they're all beautiful. Is that what it's bottled under? Pinot de Charant. Pinot de Charant, Marc de Bourgogne. There's a couple different types. God, that sounds yeah, so good. Uh, Flock, Flock de Gascon. Mm-hmm. But is, so, so is that the same? Pro- God, oh, God. I, I'm saying this really just because I want to say something about Ancho Reyes uh, and Ancho Verde, <laughs> both of which, honestly, two of my favorite spirits in the world. I spent I an entire gu- Mexico in a bottle just drinking Ancho Verde. I was guess what what is the alcohol base for those two anchos that you also make? Are you using sugar agave cane. base for that or a corn base? No, no, it, it's sugar cane spirits from Veracruz. Okay. So the liqueur tradition in Mexico is really well spread, but it's particularly strong in Veracruz, Hidalgo, and Puebla, um, and all of them are strongly influenced from the making of uh, sugar cane spirit. So. Sugar cane spirit is a commodity in a way that a woman that goes to the market will buy a quarter of high proof alcohol in the market. And then they will use the alcohol to process the leftovers of herbs and fruits and make something nice for the next time a guest comes to their house. And they will offer their local homemade uh, unconscious they may be using this. This is a tradition and they call it mosquitos in Veracruz. They call it uh, pasitas in Puebla. You have different names for, for these liqueurs. And we learn about this old recipe that was being done in a Reyes, in a, a family last name Reyes. We never really got the recipe, but we knew the basics. We knew was made by maceration of, 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 of ancho chilies, which are the, the green poblanos that we like to eat tough, but sun-dried. Um, and we knew was high in alcohol, so we leave it at 40%. Uh, and, and we knew they were not extremely sweet. They were liqueurs. But if you look at the level of sweetness in ancho, it's much less than that uh, most of other liqueurs you will find out there. Mm-hmm. And I that's know. how we try to recover, to, to, to create, recreate this, this, this formula with ancho reyes. Chilies are members of the Solanace family. They are close. They are in the same family of tobacco, of, of uh, tomato, um, of potatoes too. Uh, so, so when you taste ancho, you really see all these dry tomato, tobacco, complexity notes that are really coming from the chili. And the drying creates a total different chemistry. First, that chilies le- are led to mature. So when you harvest them, they are already red, really dark red. All the, all the chlorophylls become <laughs> anthocyan. They change from green to red. And then you sun dry and there's a lot of of sugar in the chilies itself. While Ancho Reyes Verde is made from the freshly harvest before they get bred, uh, two months earlier, they are harvested and brings a much crisp, fresh expression that is really good, brings more flavors like, like pineapple and like uh, jalapeno, like fresh, like, like salad, almost like an entire salad kind of, of, of flavor uh, that goes really well with white spirit. I normally recommend the Ancho Reyes original with brown spirit and Ancho Reyes Verde with white spirits because for some reason they really connect. But it's not a rule. Um, Ancho Reyes original can work with coffee and chocolate as well in a great way. Uh, yes, Lou. Or just drink it neat. I just drink it. I'm a, such a big fan of your maceration. I just drink that stuff neat all day long. I just, You're for savage. me, Yvonne, you really led a movement towards where flavors are really getting to right now, which is going to more savory flavors. And so not just kind of playing up this sweet, kind of insipid, the way that we think of liqueurs. And I don't even know if people think of Ancho Reyes as a liqueur. You know, people are like, yeah, I mean, it's sweet and legally it's a liqueur, but it's this flavor that I've never been able to get out of something in alcoholic form before. And it was really a, a really like leader. It was really a first of its kind. I, I'm... I don't like those peppers. 
I, I don't eat those peppers, but I love that flavor in drinks. I think it's just absolutely stunning. Those are, they're really beautiful. And it's, yeah. and it's, you said it, it's what people don't it understand the flavor. It's like people don't understand those flavors. A lot of time, I think that we culturally sometimes, especially Americans are more interested in the Scoville level of certain peppers than they are in what they actually taste like. Yep. So you consume you, you, you know, you consume habaneros because it's cool to eat habaneros, not because there's something, in, there's not a particular flavor of a habanero you like. Right? I love your no. comment, Brett. I love it because one of the things we've been struggling in communicating Ancho Reyes is that people really, because, oh, it's spicy liqueur, and they really get into it because they find fun or exciting to, to put themselves in a situation that something fiery will come out of the glass. But honestly... Ancho is a window to penetrate a new dimension of flavors. Can be used as a modifier that really can take you to very interesting places, Paul. It's exciting because it's the same raw material, but at two different developmental stages. That's also quite exciting, even though they are the same thing at, at green and, and mature, they taste different. But it's, it's, to your point, Ancho is not about the Scoville and how mature you feel by having this spiciness is truly is about an enormous amount of packed flavor that will combine with your traditional recipes like mosquitoes or margaritas or bloody marys or look you can do so many things with classic cocktails if you let ancho to enter into the drink and it's not because of the spiciness it's truly something that structures the flavor of your cocktail can I tell you really quick, kind of like my wish for Abba Solo? This has been so fascinating, Yvonne. And I'm like, I'm taking all these notes where I'm like, I have to go and like look up more you things and like learn more we things. Will invite you. I oh yeah. The second that we can travel, we're all we're all coming down. Like we oh, have to course. see this. And my life has been whiskey and agave is kind of you know my close second. Um, but is that in staying true to what you have built, is that the exploration is done in either nixtamalization of other grains? or that well, you're that, that isolating, like isolating other types of corn. So the purpose of Abasolo is to explore the potential of corn in the world of spirit. But by doing that and getting in contact with techniques like nixtamalization, well, things are opening up and, 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 and experiments doesn't end. So now I, I, I am really excited about the power of nixtamalization and what could also mean for other things because i'm like um, i'm not necessarily but it's excited not the purpose. To... It's, you will not see soon a product coming out of there uh what i'm just trying to say is i we are exploring i mean i'm not close to that but abasolo is really about about that about exploring the potential of corn maybe exploring other varieties of corn i i just trial around 15 varieties when we were taking the decision what would corn because that decision was huge was where the distillery is going to be located was, I mean, because we want the distillery to be next to the farmer, and that's why we are in Gilotepec. That also happened to be a beautiful place to be, means the hill with the corn flowers, Gilotepec. Um, and, and it's a beautiful area. There's a video around there in, that I don't know if you have seen it, but there's like a 10 minutes, um, you can look for it in, in, in YouTube. We do it through Tales of the Cocktail, but there's a a virtual visit to the distillery if you want to see the entire process there and the cornfield and, and, and everything. But uh, but was a big decision. Once we are able to launch Abasolo, that is only, I mean, it has been in the market since May, uh, we will start for sure exploring and investigating what else can be done. I guess because I, I hate to say this and people might be upset that I say this, but I, this is young whiskey. It's beautiful whiskey. It's about the exploration and the respect for this corn and for the process. I don't want to taste this whiskey in an Oloroso sherry barrel. I don't necessarily right. want to, you know, I want to right. taste something like used bourbon where it's complementary, where they build on each other, but you throw this into a Pedro Jimenez barrel and like, you can't taste the corn anymore. You know, so I'm, I'm so happy to hear that your exploration is in the process types of corn you know that's exactly where i want to see this project right. going this is absolutely beautiful thank you so yeah, you, don't need to, you don't need to mess around with the wood at all yeah well thank you thank you for the comment because of course it will depend a lot on who you ask and i really think uh, i mean mexico has the largest diversity of oak trees in the world 
That's something not many people knows. But we have five times more species of oaks than, than the entire North America. The rest, like U.S. and Canada, um, because all the different latitudes. So, so I think there's a lot to explore in oak, but Mexican oak. But versions that are not the typical American oak, and that's another line of exploration that I'm really excited to discover what the Mexican varieties of oak that hasn't been yet used for 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 aging could bring. Mm -hmm. Uh, would you do a different spirit? Would you do a different spirit with that then? Maybe, maybe create a different spirit where it's less. The spirit itself is less important. The the spirit itself has a character that could then draw out what is in the different strains of oak, rather than use an ab the, the whiskey you're making it out of solo as a base. Would you make a completely could, could different? Could be. Spirit? I think. I mean, I haven't thought about it. Uh, could be one of the issues for for such an exploration will be, of course. There's no cooperage in Mexico whatsoever. So uh, we probably will have to learn about that and, and eventually be able to do these things. But, but look, we are not only now in the business of corn. I feel myself now in the business of whiskey as well. So, so although this corn whiskey Abasolo deserves to not be too much aged, or, or I mean, there's ways to make your whiskey much more woody full in less time. I mean, and, and, and I think there's some exercises of Mexican whiskey where they are putting lots of wood into the, into the liquid. That was not the, the place we wanted to go. It's not, we don't want to be a bourbon, that bourbon is really a lot about all this spiciness that, that the American oak can bring into a liquid. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that eventually, maybe later, there's experiments in, interesting to, we have wonderful white wines in the north of Mexico, maybe something with that could be elegant and interesting for a longer aging product. I mean, we are still, this is work in the process. We, we still don't have the next. So, so, so it's not, not elegant, but okay. So I've got, I've got the Abasolo whiskey and there's my corn, right? And I've got the Ancho Reyes and there's my chili. Can you just do some <laughs> kind of, of cream liqueur so I can have an Esquites cocktail that doesn't have like any water and it's just oh, booze on I booze thought, on booze? I thought you were going to ask him to distill beans. Cause I feel like that's well, like a milpa and can, like a pumpkin. Bean, bean is Where's complex. Pumpkin? I have played with it, but it's, it's full of sulfuric compounds. Mm -hmm. And that sulfur comes out in not not the most beautiful way, <laughs> but I mean I don't but know. Can I just have my <laughs> maybe we the cheese? same way bean comes out of humans if they're eating too much. <laughs> kind of. And with that, <laughs> well, it's a good time to wrap things up here. <laughs> I just want to say before we leave that you can get for thirty seven dollars a bottle of Abasolo at Biddy's this week. Is it just this week, or is it like until the end of the month? Uh, I think it's a month. Okay, and twenty-seven dollars, um, Nixta. It's a month. Okay, that's a that's a great price for the quality of this whiskey. Um, really I don't know good. if those of you who joined us today on our little corn odyssey have had a chance to try this yet, but you should seriously pick one up. Uh, you know, you can't approach it like bourbon, and you can't approach it like scotch. It is its own unique thing, and I think it really it has this nature. Good. When you taste it, I mean, we haven't done the proper tasting, but. When you taste it, you have this vegetal experience as well. It's not only the wood or the roasted notes of this deep tortilla flavor smell, but you have this almost like the, the, the leaves that are behind, like surrounding that roasted corn behind blue, this green aspect of the corn, the vegetal thing. And, uh, and yes, at the end, the making of this liquid was very strongly focused on the white spirit we got, on the, the mm -hmm. trying to obtain the most of the flavor of the corn itself. Um, but I'm happy you are liking it. And, uh, it, and I it still has sweetness well. to balance, though. You know, it's not it's not like it's not as angular and, you know, and all as something like an agricultural rum. Like this is still a whiskey. I think whiskey drinkers are still right. going to find you know, something right. familiar in this, like very familiar in this. Um, but but it just can't be, you can't be like, well, you know, I really love Weller bourbon. So, you know, this doesn't taste like that. So, you know, it, it has to be approached in a different manner, but it, but it's, but it's so delicious. It's just so delicious. I, I think it has this kind of like distinct bit of chocolatey character that I'm not sure where that comes out of that I normally find in malt whiskeys. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I really loved it. And, you know, the first time I tried it, I didn't really know what to think of it. Uh, Brett and Joe and I were in the office and Joe loved it. I was like, yeah, I, I don't know about this. Um, but sitting here and, and, and 
slowly kind of working on it now. I think it's really opened up and it's it's a really beautiful spirit. It really is. Yeah, with two drops of water, they open up nice or a uh, small amount of ice. Yeah, and again, it's a lot of what you are saying is your con your preconceived idea of how a whiskey could, should taste may get in the middle. You have to open up to to a, a, a truly beautiful corn spirit that was is coming from 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 the best corn that exists on earth, with the purpose of letting that raw material to speak, in a beautiful combination with wood, so as a complement. But it's yeah. not a, it's not a whiskey that is the story of the wood. It's the story of the corn with wood. So so that's something that that the public has to understand. And if you want to see a little bit of this, I don't know if Cesar or Camille, that are I think they are connected to help us. Just, just putting in the chat where they can see uh, this is small uh, distillery visit, so so people can learn a little bit more through their eyes how the product is made, how the distillery looks. We have a beautifully built distillery from one of the most talented architects, modern architects in Mexico, that combine the concept of cincolotes that are the traditional structure to to store, uh, store corn with uh, with very modern uh, ideas. So we have like a glass house kind of where all the, in front of very old buildings or, or older uh, warehouses a hundred years old in the middle of a beautiful, beautiful place that used to be used to grow corn with, we have like cornfields and trees. So it's quite mm -hmm. beautiful. So I invite anybody who would like to, to watch a little bit more of the distillery to click in, uh, in that link. Two, two questions for and you real Cesar, quick. just so you know, and Pat posted it as well. Cesar Sandoval uh, gave us the link for the distillery visit and Pat just posted it. So anybody in the chat can pull that link out yeah. and visit two, the distillery. Two quick questions, I promise. I promise, two quick questions. So number one, how far is that distillery from Mexico City? And number two, uh, if you're going to add water, should you add Topo Chico? Go. Oh, good <laughs> questions. So we are proud of Topo Chico, what has been so far. <laughs> I mean, we'll see. But no, no, I, I'm a big lover of Topo Chico. Actually, I was thinking Topo Chico because let me tell you a story. I'm originally from Guadalajara and, 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 and Monterrey is a little bit more at north. So I grew up drinking Topo Chico. But suddenly the, the Texans and the Californians and Arizona is drinking all the Topo Chico in the world. So they stopped distributing Topo Chico in the rest of Mexico uh. for a long time. But just recently, Topo Chico restarted to sell as well in Mexico City. I think it's a great mineral water. I have to say, I love it. And, and, uh, and, and we are working together because we feel we are two brands from Mexico uh, offering things that are not only Mexicans. I mean, mineral water is not Mexican exclusively and whiskey is not Mexican exclusively. So we feel very happy to join forces and, and, and use Sopo Chico, which I think is a great choice if you want to, to drink uh, mineral water. It, it really blends really nicely. And, and how far is the distillery from Mexico City? If it's I land one at hour, the airport, it's one hour, one hour twenty minutes, one hour and a half. By colectivo or by driving? No, no driving. And uh, we have, as soon as I mean, we are already preparing ourselves to open up to to visitors. So we will have programs, people that arrive to Mexico City, and every every once a week we will organize a bus for people to go and return and start to discover the distillery as soon as we can. It's been a very weird launch. We launched this in the middle of, of the situation. At the beginning, we were like poor, oh, so terrible. And then we realized we were quite fortunate compared to so many people in the industry. And we stopped complaining. And instead, we decided to partner with others. And it came in a really good, nice way because I think, uh, uh, the, the trade has been quite supportive uh, with us as well as we try to support with all, all the profits we made. We were donating it from, from the first months. But, uh, but, but yeah, it's, it's one of those brands launched in the middle of COVID. I just hope that things are, that's a good thing for the brand, I hope, <laughs> in the long term. Right on. Well, it, it looks like Brett actually left to go to the bathroom. Does that mean we, that we have to wrap it, Pat? <laughs> no, he's, he's back. But well, we do oh, need to wrap it no, up. No, there's no, um, I'm back. Yvonne, th thank you so much for joining us tonight. You're welcome. I mean, this My is, pleasure. Um, 
so it's just fascinating. I, I mean, another whiskey that I've certainly ever heard of being made in anything close to like this, you know, maybe some of those weird Japanese rice whiskeys or something, but this is, uh, you know, as people that, as a collective group that's been to like, you know, dozens and dozens of whiskey distilleries, this is, uh, this is totally on its own island of, uh, of just cool. I think we got to take Yvonne to Scotland with us. We got to do an exchange program. So Yvonne, you come to Scotland with us. Exactly. And then we'll go and we'll see everything in Mexico. And we will. And Yvonne, when you I come to Chicago, idea. when you when you come to Chicago, we'll absolutely take you to Whiskey Acres because that is I one of the glass, that. the table yeah. where they're doing heirlooms. And it's only like five minutes from my so, house. I live in the middle of all our of all our GMO cornfields and and, in and, and at their, and well, Illinois. and at their heart, at their heart, they're actually farmers first. So they really started with the corn as their yeah. approach to making bourbon. So. so. I would love. I would Bob, love to learn. Egg and bread you on. Are not, egg there's no agave Monday schedule for next week. Of, of that great craft that also is. I mean that I want to learn from from the great producers in the U.S. I would love that. Love it. I Pat. Well, I disagree. Yvonne. I think that we have to get together next week, and even if it's just to wrap it all up with a bow, our four week series, which will go to eight weeks. I think we need to do it. Maybe we Misha, can just each like the the whole theme of next Misha and week. Reyes cocktails this week, there you or go. just like we just each have one different agave or Mexican spirit, and we talk about how much we love it and why it's better than what the other person is drinking. By the way, Yvonne, do you see my corn pita? I want you to look at my corn pita, Yvonne. Yeah, I'm trying that's to show nice. you this for an hour and a half now. There you go. <laughs> okay, that's cool. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you. Um, Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. A pleasure to be part of your chat. You are really fun awesome. people. Invite me any other time. You, I would love to <laughs> come back in a second. In a next week talk of another subject, Absolutely. maybe. We love well, people just, who aggressively you interrupt Brad Pontai, so you fit right in. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll we'll be on we'll be on uh, we'll be on next week for week eight of a four week so series called we'll Mezcal Monday. We'll be back next Monday. I'll get a Zoom. And everybody, thanks for joining. And we'll see you next thanks, week. Bye. Cheers, guys. Cheers, Have a good week. Cheers Bye. Bye. Thank you, Ivan. Have a solo. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.